Hello everyone, my name is Hawarawa Nomarin, and this is my channel, A Face to Fear God. This is where we learn about God, His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and their kingdom purpose. The three most important subjects that we can ever talk, learn, or discuss about in the Bible, according to John chapter 17, verse 3. The subject that I have prepared for you myself today is captioned, The Cities of Refuge. However, before we get into that, I have a, a tune once again that some of us might enjoy. <laughs> Once again, the subject that I have prepared for you and myself today is captioned, The Cities of Refuge. The Cities of Refuge were six cities chosen by God, three on the east of the Jordan River, and three on the west. The three on the west were Shechem, Kedesh, and Hebron, and the three on the east of the Jordan River were Ramoth, or Ramoth Gilead, Golad, and Bezos. There were six cities chosen by God, and God chose them in such a way so that if you were a manslayer, you would at least have one city that was within walking distance, or at least within a distance that you could go to really quickly. This story was talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 4, from verses 41 to 43, chapter 19, from verses 1 to 21, Numbers chapter 35, from verses 6 to, 24, to 34, Joshua chapter 20, from verses 1 to 9, and other places. Because the cities of refuge, of course, is a popular story in the Bible, and it was used to help us understand these last days. The only reason why the story would be preserved in the first place is so that we can use it in these last days. According to Romans chapter 15 verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11, and even, and even Hebrews chapter 10 from verses 1 to 4, specifically verse 1. All of these stories that we read in the Bible are for our samples so that we can use them as reference points when we need advice or knowledge to solve various problems and make various decisions in our daily lives. Now, the story was about people, essentially, who were manslayers. Manslayers are people who commit manslaughter. So, essentially, there were six cities, once again, that God would choose. And if you killed somebody unintentionally, intentional killing is, of course, murder. In this case, if you killed unintentionally, you would have at least one city to flee to. And the Bible always gives that popular example of you have a friend with you and you're using an axe to cut a tree down and you're doing just fine, you guys are talking about whatever, but then one of your strikes with the axe completely misses the tree and as a result of the momentum and the power that you put into it plus the extreme sharpness of the blade, it hits your friend and of course he dies. Now, you wouldn't, as some other people would do in various cases, uh, get help or do anything that would waste any precious time, you would immediately just run or walk or whatever to one of the cities of refuge. Now, the Avenger of Blood is essentially a relative of that person you killed. So, sometimes he'd find out pretty quickly, sometimes he wouldn't, but if he does, he immediately knows which city you'd go to for logical reasons. If you are the manslayer, you'd want to flee to the nearest city so that you don't have to spend as much energy and you can use the least amount of time, and therefore, the Avenger of Blood would also know which city you're going to exactly, and he would go there too. Now, the Avenger of Blood has absolute right to kill you if he sees you anywhere else besides those six cities. If you're walking there or running there, and he catches you, he has an absolute right to kill you, and he will not be guilty, but you will. If you get to the cities of refuge, or one of them, before the Avenger of Blood comes, which was probably uh, likely back then, there would be elders that were there. You wouldn't just walk in. It was They were fenced off. They were gated. They were cities that were really protected. And they were supposed to be kept righteous. They were not these normal cities or uh, bad cities like Sodom and Gomorrah or anything. They were pretty good cities. Fertile and righteously good. Or uh, spiritually good. So, you would flee to one of those cities. 
and they're going to be elders and they're going to hear about your case. You wouldn't lie to them, obviously, because if they found out they'd be telling lies, then that would end up you and being handed over back to the Avenger of Blood, uh, controlled by the elders, of course. But if your case makes sense, they believe it's correct, you will be given a shelter, you would be given food, water, all of those necessary elements for human survival. So you would be protected or sheltered there, essentially. And the Avenger of Blood would have absolutely no access to go into it. Once again, they were protected, they were fenced and gated off, so you wouldn't be able to just come in there, access the city, and do whatever you want with the person who killed your relative. Now, the whole point of this staying in the city is to remain there until the death of the high priest. The high priest was like the kings or presidents that we see today. He was like the, he held sort of the highest office in Israel. He would be taking the temple, protecting it, and doing all of those kinds of things. So once he died, you would be if you still were still living, of course, you would you would be able to leave any which whichever city that you were in in the cities of refuge, and the Avenger of Blood will no more have a right to kill you. If for any reason he still wants to satisfy his uh, feelings in his heart by killing you, which is of course revenge, not allowed, according to Romans chapter twelve verse nineteen and other places. He would end up being the one guilty, and uh, that would be taken care of by higher authorities. But we must understand, you have to not lie or anything. You have to tell the truth, and if it was a worthy or valid case of you staying in one of the six cities, you would have to remain there until the death of the high priest before you, were, you would be able to go back to living your normal life, and you would be 100% sure nobody would be able to kill you and still end up going free. It's very important we understand this. Now, once again, each of these parents represent their own important part of these last days because the story wouldn't be recorded or kept or preserved if not for serving such purposes. We should really go no further than starting with the cities. The cities are not six Individual cities like Rome in uh, Jerusalem and any other capital in this world, because this is obviously not physical. God does not see one city better than another or anything like that. So the cities just represent God's kingdom or the mountain of the Lord's house, according to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, and Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. Now, we must also understand just as how the cities are not physical and is therefore not physical to really be fleeing anywhere. When we are fleeing, we are taking to heart the knowledge of God. We are uh, learning about it according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. We are meditating about it according to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And we are trying to use it to actually live our lives because those are the only people who will actually be inheriting eternal life. According to John chapter 13, verse 17, James chapter 1, from verse 22 to 25, and other places. These cities are, or the whole idea of the cities of refuge spiritually, are set up by God and Jesus Christ. They're planning things out. They're setting up God's kingdom, fully setting it up, actually. And they're making all of these things work. Now, fleeing, the whole idea of fleeing, we can also use mountains to talk about it. If you read Matthew chapter 24 and verses 15 and 16 and other places, fleeing to the mountains uh, in, in the Matthew account, it was fleeing to the Judea mountains and stuff. Those things were very common back then, and we can also use it to describe the cities of refuge. So once again, fleeing to it is not physical, it's living the life that God wants you to. That separates you from the rest of the world, according to Zephaniah chapter 2 from verses 1 to 3, and Luke chapter 11 verse 23. Those places make sense if we understand how all of these things connect together. These cities are symbolically set up by the teachings of the saints. The saints have been called the salt of the earth, or the savior of the earth, according to Matthew chapter 5 and verses 14 and 15. In order for you to flee spiritually to those cities, you have to first of all listen to what the saints are teaching. Now, even if a saint doesn't literally confront you, it could be people learning from saints or whatever, moving the information down, and then you get to hear about it, you start studying the Bible and things like that. That is what the saints' jobs are, are, or really are. According to 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14, Isaiah chapter 62, and verses 11 and 12, Matthew chapter 24, and verses 14 and 31, and many other places. It's very important to understand this. The saints have been given a job in these last days on the earthly kind of mission that they've been given. 
to teach about the Word of God, and they're loving not their lives in this world unto the death, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They are ruthlessly, mercilessly, without anybody's uh, concern or consent or whatever, teaching about the will of God, so that people who are kind, lowly hearted, but just want a spiritual connection with God can find the true way because there is no other truth that exists in this world besides the one that saints themselves teach according to 1 John chapter 2 from verses 21 to 27 or specifically verses 21 and 27 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verses 28 to 31 and many other places all over the Bible. Now when we think of manslayers we're probably not going to think that uh, manslayers are people who literally commit manslaughter, going with what I've been talking about, physical to spiritual. Everybody in this world, no matter how rich, poor, righteous, you are still a manslayer because a manslayer in this world is a sinner, generally, and everybody is a sinner, according to Romans chapter 3 from verses 10 to 12 or 10 and 11 and verse 23 and Sam chapter 51 verse 5. Genesis chapter 3 from verses 16 to 19, Adam and Eve being the first two people who sinned and everybody else following through with that. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 and many other places all over the Bible where the wages of sin is death. Now of course, everybody living after Adam therefore inherited sin, which of course God provides stuff for, according to Titus chapter, Titus chapter 3 verse 3. And that is why God has decided to not only have the ransom sacrifice go on, which is why that happened 2,000 years ago, according to Matthew chapter 20 verse 28, John chapter 3 verse 16 and other places, but in these last days, He is providing protection for people in this world, and what He's doing in this world is going to later lead to what is, what is actually going to be happening in eternal life according to Isaiah chapter 65 from verses 17 to 25 and other places. Now, of course, the laws are still the same. If read Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, sinners die and stuff. So we should never be discouraged by the fact that we won't live forever as of right now. We're still going to die and dead people only have the hope of resurrection, according to John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29. But one thing that is really worthy of being stressed is the ransom sacrifice only had anything to do with the death we cannot control of, we did not have control of, which is of course the death that Adam and Eve had brought onto us. We were not there when anything of that happened, so we couldn't control them or stop them from doing that, and God has provided the ransom sacrifice for that. But if we still go ahead and sin after that, which is considered sinning deliberately, that is wrong, it is false, because your opp the opportunity from the ransom sacrifice is supposed to be not taken for granted, but it is supposed to be taken truthfully. You should never be like Lot's wife, of course, because she took the opportunity God had given her and her family for granted, and, and as a result, she was killed, according to Second Peter chapter 2, and verses 6 and 7, and other places. You must understand this. So, when we see that we are manslayers and stuff, we must understand that deliberate sin should never be done. We should take this advantage God has given us and take it to the end. Because if we are not interested in this opportunity, God might easily just take the Holy Spirit away from us, enabling us to do it, according to Romans chapter 8 verse 9, and give it to somebody else, preventing us from inheriting salvation. According to Hebrews chapter 10 from verses 26 to 29, Matthew chapter 12 and verses 31 and 32, and many other places all over the Bible. Now, Moving on, after we get into cities and manslayers, who are those judges and um, the avenger of blood? You can start with the avenger of blood. Now, we might think that the avenger of blood is another person physical because in the story, the, both the avenger of blood and the manslayer were physical. But in this case, the avenger of blood is only one person for everybody in this world, and that is Jesus Christ. He can also be called God's vindicator, his field marshal, his chief judge, whatever you want to call him, because they all pretty much mean the same thing. His referee, the person that is actually judging in this world. Now, what Jesus Christ is doing, especially as he is crowned king of God's glorious government, according to Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1 and other places, we must understand that what Jesus Christ is doing is at a very high level. Now, the reason why I mention this is some people are not concerned about taking refuge. They're just talking about what Jesus Christ is doing, how righteous people can help, and all those kinds of things. Not even allowing God to do his own thing. They're trying to push it along for him as if he's not going fast enough. 
This is a very common behavior. Many people do not worry about their own selves first. They're judging other people, which is wrong if you don't judge yourself first, according to Matthew chapter 7 from verses 1 to 5. And they're not even focusing on their own salvation. They're focusing on what God is doing. They read that God is doing many things and they want to help Him. Jesus Christ is doing many things, but He doesn't expect us to be worrying about Satan and uh, how Jesus Christ is going to defeat Him, according to Revelation chapter 12 and 19. What Jesus Christ is doing is great, but we must focus on our own salvation. He is judging uh, everything that needs to be judged as this is judgment time, according to Psalm chapter 96, verse 13, and John chapter 12, verse 48. But we as Christians must focus on our own salvation to prevent Satan, who Jesus Christ is defeating, from easily taking us away. Because, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, his main purpose in this world is, especially right now, is to take people who want to take refuge away using the various tricks that he has kept this world in for so long, according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, and many other places all over the Bible. Then the actual judges or the elders are the saints. Now you could say that Jesus Christ is also a judge. It wouldn't be wrong, but the saints have been given that rule of being also chief judges and kings of God's glorious government. According to Luke chapter 22, from verses 28 to 30, Revelation chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6 and other places. In the Luke account, Jesus Christ has stated, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. That ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Once again, you can also read Revelation chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6, John chapter 5, from verses 22 to 27, specifically verses 22 and 27, Psalm chapter 149, from verses 5 to 9, and many other places all over the Bible. It is a very big role that they've been given in the heavenly realm. It's even more important than the, than the actual things that they're doing in this world teaching about the will of God. Now, all of this information is absolutely unnecessary if we actually don't know how to take refuge. Now, before I even get to any reasons, once again must emphasize taking refuge can be done in your own house. It is not running to Jerusalem. It is not running to anywhere in this world. It is you just reading about the Bible and worshiping God. Once again, we must understand that we can't take refuge without reading the Bible. Because you can't know that we are in these last days, it is judgment time, and we have to do something about our lives without even knowing about anything about it. According to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Also, once we read about the Bible, we must also meditate about it. According to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, we must self-examine ourselves. Uh, with the Word of God because we can't use it and actually live our lives with it without connecting ourselves to it according to 2nd Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 examine yourselves whether you be in the faith prove your own selves this whole idea of taking refuge is so that we can become new creatures when we step in to the cities of refuge we're becoming whole new people when we were out according to 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 anybody who decides to worship Christ becomes a new creature yea all things are passed away yea all things are become new but we must understand that when we say that we we can't leave the cities of refuge this is another important point we are not physically walking away or anything it is a stopping to worship God essentially we should never let Satan uh, destroy our worship of God. We must battle it out. We must go through our temptations because they're not to destroy us. They're actually to strengthen our faith. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, James chapter 1 from verses 2 to 4, and many other places. Satan is a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. According to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, but if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. According to James chapter 4, verse 7. To conclude, one thing that we haven't exact, or I haven't exactly mentioned is that the death of the high priest is not literally Jesus Christ dying. It's a direct translation of it, but what Jesus Christ is doing is his work and everything. He is the high priest, though. That's uh, something worth mentioning. According to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, and Sam chapter 9, verse 11. But the death of the high priest is the end of his priestly work. And this was well discussed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verses 24 to 28. God has given Jesus Christ a big role to rule his kingdom, 
according to Psalms chapter 110 and verses 1 and 2, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7, and chapter 32 verse 1, Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14 and other places. Once he is finished, he will hand all of these things back to God that he's done, so that God may be all in all. Once again, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verses 24 to 28, Jesus Christ will be, get, will be given a lot of rewards for the work he has done, and then the eternal life process will continue. According to Isaiah chapter 65, from verses 17 to 25, and many other places all over the Bible, but we cannot inherit such rewards except if we walk into the cities of refuge we learn about it we do our we do whatever necessary in order to worship god properly and we don't leave the city because deliberate sins are not allowed according to matthew chapter 12 and verses 31 and 32 hebrews chapter 10 from verses 26 to 29 if you also read second peter chapter 2 from verses 20 to 22 hebrews chapter 6 from verses 46 and many other places all over the bible it helps us to understand that the cities of refuge and thus fleeing to it properly brings us great rewards, but leaving it before it is time prevents us from actually inheriting eternal life. And I feel like I want to end my talk on the subject in cities of refuge. For the for the closing of this episode, I once again have a tune that some of us might enjoy. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed this video, hope you learned something most importantly because it is very important to understand why the cities of refuge and actually taking refuge is one of the most important subjects that we can ever learn in the entire Bible. Thank you.